So the message today is about Indigenous Friends of Israel, which Norman and I co-founded in July 2017. Although, as the Centre for International Reconciliation and Peace, Jewish-Gentile reconciliation has been something on our agenda for well over 25 years now. So the first part of it is the reasons why Indigenous people might support Israel. So one of them is because of the, the tribes. So there were about 500 uh, Aboriginal tribes in Australia pre-European um, settlement and so the, uh, the tribal aspect of uh, Jewish people in the sense that we know that there are 12 tribes of Israel. So the identification of the tribes is a really uh, important one. So we know of the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, they were named after the sons of Jacob or Israel. From the oldest to the youngest, we have Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph and Benjamin. But also Joseph's sons Ephraim and Manasseh became the two half-tribes uh, rather than Joseph himself named in there. So it's a very interesting story of the tribes but uh, you know that's something that Indigenous people can uh, really connect um, with Jewish people because of the uh, tribal aspect and I'll share something more about that later. Family ties are strong as well. So the number two point is attachment to the land. So there's a very strong attachment to land shared by both Jews and Aboriginal people. It is very rare to find an Australian Aboriginal person who would live overseas um, for that reason, uh, whereas you won't find that in, in other groups. Uh, also with uh, Jewish people, there's a very strong attachment to the land. So Aboriginal people have sacred sites, also Jewish people have sacred sites, but the whole land is uh, something very important um, to them. And so the Israelites actually entered Canaan, um, currently called Israel, um, 1250 BC. Now that's a really long time ago, about 3275 years ago. So the third point um, is the shared indigeneity and shared colonial experience. Okay, so Australian Aboriginal people were colonised, as we know, in 1788 when the British came to Australia. Fairly short-lived when you think of uh, the history of the world. Uh, nevertheless, it was a traumatic experience and we do see some consequences of that still today with uh, closing the gap in the sense that socio-economic indicators do show that there's a shorter life expectancy and, and health, education, housing, income, etc. disparities. So I'm not focusing too much on any of that today, I'm just basically flagging it. So whether Aboriginal people were in Australia from the beginning of time, and that's contested when the beginning of time was, um, some people say Aboriginal people have been here 65,000 years. Well, that doesn't actually fit in with um, other ways of counting time, as we know. But whether they were here from the beginning or whether they um, migrated here, as some scientists and historians say, uh, is um, not so much the, the fact at the moment, they are recognised as the Indigenous people of the land of Australia, okay? Same thing as the Maori people, they weren't the original inhabitants of New Zealand, um, but they accepted, are accepted as the Indigenous people of, of New Zealand. So, some of these things I'm saying people will have different opinions on, but basically, um, Throughout history, uh, Israel 
or previously called Palestine after the uh, Roman um, occupation and wars, uh, they were colonised by many, many groups over the years. So we have the Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians, uh, Greeks, Romans, Arabs, Fatimids, Seljuk Turks, Crusaders, Egyptians and Mamelukes. A credible um, list because Israel was the crossroads of um, three continents, Asia, Africa and Europe, um, it, it is a very strategic location and that's one of the years, time, reasons it's been colonised and invaded so many times. Um, as you might imagine with a great deal of trauma associated with that. Now, uh, so from about 1517 to 1917, uh, we have the Ottoman Empire um, in charge of that area. And we know when the British and others defeated the Ottomans and the Germans in World War I, then uh, the UN uh, at that stage um, well, let me, let me say the precursor to the UN set up the uh, British mandate um, in that area. And uh, until 1948, when um, Israel got its um, independence and declared its nationhood, which we've just recently celebrated 75 years of. So with regard to um, Islam and the Arabs, uh, Basically, they invaded Palestine in the 7th century and the Muslim army conquered Jerusalem, held by the Byzantine Romans, in November 636. So there has been an Arab presence for about 1,300 years um, in um, what we now call Israel, which was its earlier name anyway. So dispersion is uh, also a commonality um, between Aboriginal people in Australia and the Jewish people. So uh, many Aboriginal people move from their ancestral lands onto reserves, uh, ostensibly for their protection from white settlers, um, but it did end up in a rule where they were um, governed fairly harshly on reserves and Amazingly, in Queensland, that persisted right up until 1984 um, when uh, Aboriginal people received local government um, in Queensland as one example of that. And uh, so this has created some difficulty with all of the native title legislation that came in after Marbo, the Native Title Act being 1993, um, in identifying uh, who are the correct name title holders of land because of being moved around um, like that. So um, Jewish people um, suffered a very severe uh, dispersion. So when the 10 tribes of the Northern Kingdom of Israel were defeated by the Assyrians, they were removed um, from their land and are since known as the Ten Lost Tribes of Israel, you would have heard that expression. So they've been, and they're now sort of part of the Jewish diaspora in many nations of the world. So what often happened in those days, and it, and it did happen um, in their lands, was that other people were moved by Assyria onto their lands as um, a vassal um, people under Assyrian rule. Uh, that happened to try to prevent the Jewish people from moving back there. Later on, we have the southern kingdom of Judah and Benjamin um, attacked by the Babylonians, and the Babylonians carried them off in captivity to Babylon. We have, you'd be familiar with the stories of that and uh, also the wonderful story of their return. After World War II and the Holocaust, we know that six million uh, European uh, Jews um, were killed in the Holocaust. And so what happened was that there was a movement of European Jewry um, into um, 
It was called pre-state Israel at that time, or Palestine, moving there to try and get safety and try and build a, a new life with their decimated families. So there have been, uh, and of course we have people from around, Jewish people from around the world making Aliyah um, to Israel in the times uh, since we had the reformed state of Israel in 1948. And there's been a charge against Israel that it is a settler colonialist state. Now, actually, it's quite ridiculous, I believe, to make that assertion because the Jewish people would have to be one of the most colonised people um, in the world. And so for their descendants to return to Israel um, is not colonisation, it's really decolonisation. Okay. Um, so, but there has always been a remnant of Jewish people uh, in the land. Even though the Jews really, when you look at it, they have been ethnically cleansed from Israel over many centuries. So many people in the world have been upset at the rebuilding of the Jewish um, state. But you know, it is just one very tiny piece of land, uh, a democratic state in the Middle East with many hostile Arab nations around it. Although, of course, as you know, there has been later on treaties with Jordan and, and Egypt. So we know that um, uh, in 1948, after uh, Israel became the modern state of Israel, what we had was five Arab armies um, invaded Israel to try to um, defeat it. Miraculously, um, Israel was uh, successful. And we had the 1967 war with the reunification of Jerusalem. And mind you, it's worth noting that um, even, even though there's been a lot of um, upset over that, um, Jordan only held uh, only held the uh, East Jerusalem for maybe about 20 years. Um, all the rest of the time, it had been uh, part of Israel proper. And uh, so we know 1973 war, and of course there have been many um, times since then uh, where we have had um, rocket fire. We've done it just recently, got a ceasefire um, after a, um, a trouble broke out with over a thousand missiles or rockets, I should say. Apparently 1,300 fired into Israel targeting civilians. Uh, they do have what they call David's sling. That is kind of an iron dome thing that prevents most of those missiles um, landing in a way that would injure the inhabitants. Although there was uh, loss of life of one elderly Jewish lady and one um, Arab man. Um, in that because we know about 20% of the citizens of Israel today um, are Arab and uh, uh, are gainfully employed um, in Israel and vote in the elections and there are also Arab people um, in the uh, Knesset or Israel parliament as well, um, in the police force, um, etc. So mostly well integrated. Uh, even though you hear charges of apartheid, but I'm not going to go into that um, today. But we know that there are still um, terrorist organisations who want to wipe Israel off the map. So number four um, is a similar history of racism, discrimination, persecution and, and marginalisation and the need for um, resilience. So I don't have time to go uh, into details on that, but um, Aboriginal people and Jewish people um, both know what discrimination and racism uh, and marginalisation is all about. Uh, but amazingly, for Jewish people, there's, it's been such a long history of it that it has its own special name of anti-Semitism. 
So, and I actually have uh, written uh, at the request of a Jewish organisation in Perth, We Are Here Foundation, Eli Rabinovich. I've um, written a study guide or handbook on the Holocaust, including the Aboriginal response and uh, anti-Semitism. So um, that is available as a free resource on their website. So 